Okay guys, I wanted to make a uh, quick video here uh, as we kick off the online classes for the rest of the semester. Uh, this first video will cover the first section on the acid-base chapter, uh, the Bronsted-Lowry concept of acids and bases. We've got some learning objectives here. Uh, I'll let you go through those on your own, and I'm going to just jump straight into the content. So on this slide, uh, I'm presenting two ways of thinking about acids and bases. Uh, the first way, which is called the Arrhenius concept, states that an acid is a species that increases the concentration of H plus in aqueous solution and a base is a species that increases the concentration of hydroxide in solution. And so I've given two examples, one of an Arrhenius acid. Over here we have perchloric acid, and when it dissociates in water, it forms H plus cations and perchlorate ions. And so because the perchloric acid forms H plus in solution, we call it an acid. Here, uh, in the second reaction, sodium hydroxide, uh, it dissolves readily in water to give us sodium ions and hydroxide ions. And because sodium hydroxide produces hydroxide ions in aqueous solution, we call it a base. A different way of thinking about acids and bases involves this Bronsted-Lowry concept, which features a proton transfer reaction. And so that's the fundamental idea in the Bronsted-Lowry concept. Uh, in the Bronsted-Lowry definition, an acid is a species that donates a proton in a proton transfer reaction, and a base is a species that accepts a proton in a proton transfer reaction. And so I've taken the same strong acid here from the Arrhenius concept, and then what I'm showing you in this third reaction on the slide is the Bronsted-Lowry uh, way of thinking about how perchloric acid reacts in water. So the perchloric acid reacts with the water. It donates a proton from the acid to the base, the water in this case, and that gives us hydronium ion and leaves behind uh, the per perchlorate ion. And so here we have the acid it's donating a proton. The water is acting as the base. Uh, in this next example, we have a weak base, ammonia, which accepts a proton from water. So in this case, the water is acting as the acid, and the ammonia is the base. This gives us the ammonium cation and leaves behind hydroxide. These types of reactions that we're looking at for acids, they're called acid ionization reactions. And for bases, they're called a base ionization reaction. Uh, we've talked about strong versus weak electrolytes previously. And just like you can have a strong or weak electrolyte, you can also have a strong or weak acid. A strong acid and a strong base are ones that completely dissociate in water. So for example, hydrochloric acid is a very strong acid. It donates a proton to water, giving you hydronium, leaving behind chloride, and effectively 100% of the uh, HCl in solution will dissociate. Uh, likewise, potassium hydroxide is a very strong base. When it dissolves in water, it completely dissociates. Uh, and since it forms hydroxide, we call it a base. On the other hand, we can also have acids and bases that only partially dissociate in water. And the two examples here, these are the quintessential examples of a weak acid, here acetic acid, and a weak base, ammonia. And so these are proton transfer reactions as well. You've got acetic acid donating a proton to water. That gives us hydronium and leaves behind an acetate ion. And then we've already looked at the ammonium, ammonia ionization reaction. Since these are weak acids and bases, note that we use the double-sided arrow to indicate that both reactants and products are present at equilibrium. 
And in reality, only a small fraction of the weak acid and the weak base actually dissociate. Most of the acetic acid will be in its molecular form, and most of the ammonia will be in its molecular form. I have a couple more points on proton transfer reactions. Um, every acid in a proton transfer reaction has a corresponding conjugate base, and vice versa. Every base in a proton transfer reaction has a corresponding conjugate acid. And when you look at a proton transfer reaction, there's an acid and a base on each side of the reaction. And so I'll draw your attention down below to the reaction here. This is the ammonia dissociation reaction again. Here, as you go from reactants to products, the water acts as the acid. It donates a proton to the base, ammonia. You can also think about this reaction in reverse, where starting with the ammonia, you can think of the ammonia as donating a proton to hydroxide, which will give you ammonia and water. And so on this side of the reaction, since the ammonium is the proton donor, we call it the acid. The hydroxide is accepting a proton, we call that the base. And then the acid on the reactant side of the reaction is connected with the base on the other side of the proton transfer reaction, and we say that they form a conjugate acid-base pair. Uh, likewise for ammonia and ammonium, they also form a conjugate acid-base pair. And what you want to be able to do is to take a proton transfer reaction and be able to recognize what are the acids and what are the bases, and which acids and bases are paired together. And so we have an example uh, problem here where we're given three um, uh, proton transfer reactions, and we're being asked to identify the acids and the bases on, uh, in the reaction. And so starting with part A here, uh, here I've written out the reaction. You can see that the hydro hydrofluoric acid species is donating a proton to the hydrogen carbonate. That leaves behind a fluoride ion and gives us carbonic acid. So in this proton transfer reaction on the reactant side, HF is the acid and the hydrogen carbonate ion is the base. On the other side of the reaction, uh, you can think of this as a proton transfer between carbonic acid and fluoride. So carbonic acid is the acid and fluoride is the base. And the acids and bases on each side are linked together. So the hydrogen carbonate ion is the conjugate base to carbonic acid and fluoride is the conjugate base to hydrofluoric acid. Uh, in this second example, part B here, again we're dealing with hydrogen carbonate, but this time it's reacting with hydroxide. And the action is a little bit different. In this case, hydrogen carbonate is donating a proton to hydroxide. That leaves behind carbonate and gives us water. Going in the other direction, we can think of a proton as being transferred from water to carbonate. Uh, that gives us the hydrogen carbonate ion uh, and leaves behind hydroxide. Okay, so we've got an acid and a base on each side of the reaction, and the ones that are paired, the acid on the reactants is paired with the base on the products, and the base on the reactants is paired with the acid on the products. Uh, between the two examples, we see that in one case, hydrogen carbonate acts as a base, and in the second reaction, hydrogen carbonate acts as an acid. And species that can act as either an acid or a base are called amphiprotic. And I have a separate slide on that uh, in, a few, in a few seconds. Uh, before we get to that, we're going to talk about the so-called auto-ionization of water, or self-ionization. Water can dissociate on its own, so if you have a sample of pure water, some of the water <clears throat> will transfer a proton to another water. This will give you hydronium and hydroxide uh, in aqueous solution. Uh, and this is a reversible reaction. And we can write, for any reversible reaction, we can write an equilibrium constant expression uh, for it. In this case, this reaction is so important, uh, it gets its own equilibrium constant symbol. So we call it a Kw as opposed to a Kc, which we've used in our previous discussions. And just like any equilibrium constant, it can be expressed as the product concentrations raised to their stoichiometric coefficients divided by the reactant concentrations 
raised to their stoichiometric coefficients. But in this case, the reactants are pure liquids, and as we know, we don't include pure liquids or pure solids in the equilibrium constant expressions. So we just end up with a product of the ion concentrations, and that's why this is called the ion, ion product constant for water. At 25 degrees Celsius, the Kw value is 1 times 10 to the minus 14, which is very, very small. And what that means is that this equilibrium reaction um, at 25 degrees Celsius is very much shifted to the reactant side of the reaction. So not very much water um, dissociates to form ions. That Kw value, it does depend on temperature. And so as you change the temperature, the value of Kw will also change. Um, you can also do things like add additional acid, so you can drop some hydrochloric acid into water, or you can drop some sodium hydroxide into water, and what that's going to do is it's going to change the hydronium and hydroxide concentrations. However, the concentration of hydronium and the concentration of hydroxide that you have at equilibrium will always satisfy this Kw expression. So this statement is always true, no matter what aqueous solution you're dealing with. In this example problem, we're going to use the Kw expression to first find, <clears throat> um, find the hydronium and hydroxide concentrations in pure water at 25 degrees Celsius. So I've written out the autoionization uh, reaction for water. And based on the stoichiometry, you can see that um, for, every waters, for every pair of waters that react with one another, you're going to get one hydronium and one hydroxide. So the concentration of hydronium must equal the concentration of hydroxide for pure water. Uh, we can use that in the Kw expression. So we take the Kw equilibrium expression, and we can substitute in for the hydroxide concentration and we'll wind up with Kw equals the hydronium concentration squared. Since we know the value of Kw, we know that the concentration of hydronium squared is equal to Kw. By taking the square root of both sides, we can find the hydronium and the hydroxide concentration equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 7 moles per liter. These relationships here are very important in, in aqueous chemistry, and so really you should be committing this entire set of, uh, of equations to memory. That is, you need to know what is the autoionization reaction for water. You need to know the Kw expression and the Kw value at 25 degrees Celsius. And then you need to know at 25 degrees Celsius the concentration of hydronium and the concentration of hydroxide in pure water is 1 times 10 to the minus 7 moles per liter. Uh, for this follow-up problem, which I haven't solved on the slide here, uh, what would happen if you change the temperature? Well, that would change the equilibrium constant. In this case, it increases, and you would solve the problem in the same way. The only difference is that you would replace the 1 times 10 to the minus 14 with this new value of 2.4 times 10 to the minus 13. And you're going to get different concentrations for the hydronium and hydroxide concentration. Here we've got another example using the Kw equation. This time we have a solution of carbon dioxide dissolved in water. Carbon dioxide forms hydronium. Okay, and in this case we have a carbon dioxide solution that has a concentration of hydronium equal to 2 times uh, 10 to the minus 6 moles per liter. And we're being asked to find the concentration of hydroxide. So using the Kw equation, we see that the Kw equation relates the concentration of hydronium to the concentration of hydroxide. So we can solve the equation for the hydroxide concentration. That gives us Kw over the hydronium concentration. We can substitute in those numbers. And then this gives us the hydroxide concentration. In this case, 5 times 10 to the minus 9 moles per liter. So given the hydronium concentration, you can find the hydroxide concentration. And in a different problem, you could be given the hydroxide concentration, and then you could solve for the hydronium concentration. And this will always work no matter what, um, no matter what type of aqueous solution you're working with. Uh, this statement is always true. And at 25 degrees Celsius, this is the value of Kw that you would use. Here's my slide on 
amphiprotic species. So an amphiprotic species is one that can act as either an acid or a base. Uh, a prime example of an amphiprotic species is water. Uh, in this case, water is acting as an acid. It's donating its proton to ammonia. However, in this reaction here, water is acting as a base. The acetic acid is donating a proton to water. So water is the prime example of an amphiprotic species. Other species, like we've looked at already, hydrogen carbonate and hydrogen sulfate, um, which are acidic anions, these are usually amphiprotic as well. Uh, in this example here, what we're going to be doing is looking at um, uh, reactions of amphiprotic species where in one case the hydrogen sulfite ion is acting as an acid with hydroxide and in a second case it's acting as a base with hydroiodic acid. So here we've got uh, in this first reaction uh, the hydrogen sulfite ion is acting uh, as an acid with hydroxide. It's donating its proton. That's going to give us water and it's going to leave behind the sulfite ion. In this second case, the hydrogen sulfite ion is acting as a base. The hydroiodic acid donates a proton to the hydrogen sulfate, sulfite ion. That gives us sulfurous acid and leaves behind uh, an iodine. Okay, so this is an example of a amphiprotic species. And then I'll leave the second example involving the dihydrogen phosphate ion uh, for you as an exercise to work through. Okay, we'll stop it right there.